Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies. Produced under the auspices of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with engaged and innovative teachers of international relations. The goal? to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by exploring ways for translating ideas into terms that help the uninitiated gain new perspectives and new understanding. That's even more difficult when what we teach challenges fundamental assumptions and even students' sense of the nature of reality. There's one thing to venture into such conversations for oneself. It requires even more to lead others there as well. Today's conversation is with Dr. James Derdary, Michael Hinsey Chair of International Security Studies, and Dr. Jason Waters, Postdoctoral Research Fellow, both at the Center for International Security Studies at the University of Sydney in Australia. They have been working together on the fundamentals of quantum IR, which seeks to find connections between quantum theory, which explains the dynamics of subatomic particles, and explanations of global political dynamics. Our conversation explores definitions of quantum IR as a theoretical approach to global politics, approaches to teaching quantum IR as an exercise in unlearning assumptions and authorizing innovative thinking, and the value of dialogical, flat, and mutually empowering pedagogical contexts in which everyone involved thinks of their interactions as resting on the power to make the future. So James Derdarian and Jason Waters, welcome to The Teaching Curve. I'm thrilled that you're here. It's uh, it's an exciting conversation, and we're uh, I'm sure the audience is going to be really interested in what you guys have to say. Yeah, thanks well, for I'm us. glad we could. Yeah, I'm glad we could overcome the tyranny of distance, as we say here in Australia, and make this happen. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question I ask people is to help us center the context for you all as teachers. And that requires that you talk a little bit, please, about your institution. But I ask you to do that by telling me about who the students are that you're usually teaching. Uh, well, I'm glad to, to stop. We, the University of Sydney, when I arrived, um, pretty much on a, on a whim almost, um, it is, was known for its um, group of remarkable scholars who were teaching from the critical security studies arm or or area of security and um, from all over the world. And you didn't see that in the United States. There's a few little havens here and there when, under Thomas Bierstecker at the Watson Institute where I, I had left. Um, and um, it was it was really a, a mecca. Um, and um, I wish I could say it still exist as such, but as all things, so it goes in, you know, academic institutions, you have um, these ebbs and flows, and I don't know where the next one will be, but um, I'm hoping that Jason will be leading it. So Jason, what was your perspective as a student, at uh, initially a student at University of Sydney? Yeah, um, well, just for some context, the University of Sydney, it's the oldest university in Australia. Um, it's one of the largest, I think we've got about 50, to 55,000 students total. Um, it's about 30,000 odd undergraduate, 20,000 odd postgraduate, and then um, postgraduate research students. So it is a massive university, um, takes up a decent chunk of Sydney, if we're being completely honest. Uh, it has its own postcode, actually. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's a great little university. Um, and the reason that I was drawn there was exactly what James said. You had this really great collection of uh, just aspects of IR defining scholars. Well, I'm I'm interested, of course, in talking to you because of these projects, uh, the the themes that you're working on at the moment, which have to do with quantum IR, and that is a combination of terms that I think the field is still getting used to. I wonder if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about a definition and why you think that that quantum adjective makes a big difference in how people think about IR. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So I think James and I will probably slightly disagree about the definition of quantum IR, um, which is probably something that will get across, you know, anyone who you ask, you know, what is quantum IR? They'll let you give a slightly different definition. Uh, but you get the exact same thing with realism and liberalism. Uh, no one will give the same two answers. So for me, quantum IR is just an approach to international relations that takes quantum mechanics seriously. Um, it doesn't apply one particular interpretation of quantum mechanics saying that, you know, the entire world is a wave function or um, there are multiple universes that are ontologically real. It just says that our fundamental um, assumptions about how reality operates in most political theories, which are Newtonian, are wrong. Or at least they're approximations of a deeper quantum uh, system. Um, and then it's looking at how would our understandings of politics and world systems change if we changed these assumptions. Mm. Yeah, I think um, Jason, who wrote one of the first, and I think one of the best um, PhDs on the sort of co-evolution of um, quantum mechanics and international relations as a discipline in the interwar period, um, is absolutely right that that it's it's not just simply a, a mode of knowledge um, um, and now increasingly a mode of production, given that quantum technologies and the first quantum revolution helped, of course, produce a game-changing technology of the bomb, the atomic mm -hmm. bomb. You, without quantum mechanics, it would not have been the uh, dropping of two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but the second quantum revolution is, is I prefer to um, you know, use typologies in this case would be the um, information revolution. You would not have the microprocess of the semiconductor without quantum mechanics. Um, and we are now entering a third quantum revolution um, having to do with quantum sensing first and now quantum computing. Um, you know, already we have all of the major big tech companies um, developing um, the, the rudiments of quantum computing. Um, quantum communication, the Chinese leading the way. Um, with a, a quantum internet on the horizon as well. So, you know, as to this extent that, you know, technologies shape all kinds of um, modes of thinking, I'm not being technologically determinist and saying that it has to be one mode of thinking, but basically we need quantum IR to understand the world better. It's a better heuristic and not just simply because of the technologies, but also because of the interconnectivities, um, the fact that, you know, things happen on one side of the world and we it instantly has an impact on another side mm -hmm. of the world. The entanglements, the superpositioning of violence, you know, how do you identify what's a war now? It's, it takes so many different forms. And then most importantly of all is the observation effect, um, which are the measurement problem as they call it in quantum mm -hmm. um, mechanics that, you know, how you look, measure, observe something, you know, can conjure up realities. It's a very fertile period and very exciting. And um, well, I was lucky to have two students here, just brilliant on this, um, Jason, um, but also Nicholas Harrington uh, wrote a dissertation looking at Niels Bohr's work um, in, in, in contrasting it to Thomas Hobbes um, as, as sort of a new realism. You know, is this a more real realism coming out of quantum mechanics? I think that both Jason and I are, um, we respect our differences and that's the most important element of quantum too is that there's not one truth complementarity yeah. coming through uh niels bohr says you know contradictions are good paradoxes are good we like those the, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the quantum principles the principles that uh the physicists have asserted govern matter at a particular level of uh, and energy and they that are those the same rules, would you say, or is this some kind of metaphor? Uh, is it, <laughs> would you yeah. say that it that the theory of quantum IR helps us to understand how things work, or that it is the rules for how things work? Well, I'm going to let Jason take that one because that's really the, the the crux of his his dissertation. But but I will just my you know my sort of flip immediate response is that you know what's the truth but a metaphor whose metaphorical nature we've forgotten i mean that's nietzsche's famous retort but um i'll let jason take that and then i'll i have a few little um perhaps asides as well 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it kind of comes back to the point that IR in general has been really bad at explaining what, ha what happens in the world, but also just horrible at predicting. Um, so we're not currently at the stage of trying to come up with a you know predictive system of quantum politics. We're just trying to come up with better ways of understanding it. Um, so that really go goes back to what we we're talking about before and also what um, Peter Katzenstein has been working on recently with his work on worldviews. Um, is how can we conceptualize the world in a way which is as accurate as possible and encompasses as much of the phenomena that we can see and measure. Um, yeah, that's all I can really add there. And, you know, the fact we do rely on science um, for our understandings of international relations. We did, you know, sometimes in a, in a almost... Um, uh, how to put it? It's, sometimes it's on the surface. Sometimes it's more developed. But certainly, you know, Newtonian ideas, Cartesian ideas, linear ways of thinking that came out of the 17th century um, influenced Hobbes. Um, Hobbes, of course, one of the fathers, along with Machiavelli, of uh, this, you know, mechanistic, you know, in a terms of, you know, realist linear model of the world. Um, so it's not. You know the the anti science that has plagued some of the more critical, reflexive modes of thinking in international relations, held us back. I think from adapting mm. to, you know, new science. And you know, my mentor Headley Bull, of course, led the charge against the North American school of behavioralism that he thought was was um, to the detriment of our understanding of the world. And you know. In this case, measurement turned into a fetish, mm -hmm. um, and you know what became more important was the the tools of measurement than the what was being measured. And I think this is you know so the classical approach certainly bears some of the responsibility for this anti scientific um, call it an attitude. But I think there's another generation that's not so willing to be put into these little boxes or pigeonholes that we. We grew up with in, in in the teaching the pedagogy of international relations. What well, what this is getting at for me is is a very interesting dynamic. I mean, there's a, uh, a, a to use simplifying terms, right? We have an instructor and a student here, and there's a relationship about how those ideas are enabled in that relationship, and how they are mutually reinforcing and where that stuff comes from. So I'm interested in how you created an atmosphere in which that relationship of ideas flourished. Well, Jason probably can tell you uh, how many times he, he, he he's uh, interrupted me, corrected me, uh, told me where I was wrong. Um, so and I encourage that. I mean, if you look at if there's one word that sort of, I think, captures our relationship, this relation, it's dialogical. Um, and, and that's important. We, we have a very, right now, we have a pretty good research team funded by Carnegie and, and then DFAT, which is our, you know, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, and it's very flat. You know, we have pre-docs, post-docs, mm. and um, everybody has a go at each other. And that's very important. Um, most of the new ideas I get come from below, not my peers. Um, and that's just sort of a self-interested reason to maintain that dialogical, critical, pluralist, call it what you will, um, uh, attitudes uh, in 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 our research and our teaching. And our goal is to eventually, you know, teach this in, together. The course that you've designed is clearly a, a course for postgraduate students. Um, it is clearly a kind of semester context, build a syllabus, what would we do and how would we do this? But I found the pedagogical approach that's built into the syllabus to be really fascinating in that kind of um, management of the tension between the dialogic that you're talking about and the need to get people up to speed on what quantum is, how what thinking has already happened in the application of it to IR and global politics. Uh, 
how do you navigate that um, need for people to be inducted into the conversation before they can really participate in it in a in a very um, in energizing way? Yeah, so the way we designed that course, um, uh, sorry, let's open that up quickly so I can have a look. Um, it sort of starts off with the history and prehistory of quantum mechanics. And um, the reason we chose to go that route is just when you say quantum, half the people will shut down. Um, the other half will either think of really bad science fiction movies or, you know, the finished quantum dishwashing tablets they use or the sneakers that they want to buy. Um, or I think Samsung has got quantum LED TVs now. So there's a whole lot of quantum branding out there. Mm. Um, so we really just wanted to contextualize, you know, what is quantum and how is it different to what um, came before and how, how we still think about the world today. The easiest way to look at that is to go back and look at what problems were plaguing physicists and physics and the scientific community at the turn um, of the last century and what ideas arose to sort of overcome those um, problems and how those ideas led to quantum mechanics. Um, it's not, you know, a groundbreaking method for approaching this. It just, it's a really easy way of humanizing and making all of this sensible to real world problems. Obviously, we don't have the capacity or the time or the contact hours to teach the maths. And honestly, I don't think J James and I would either be equipped to do it. Um, but what we can do is teach what is already in our skill set, and that is the philosophy. And a lot of physics, a lot of um, philosophy of science uh, relates to the philosophy of quantum mechanics. It's something that, you know, we can read, we can understand it, our students can read and understand for the most part. And there is a ton of really good resources out there. Yeah. And then the last bit is then bringing that back in to applying that to real world problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what aspects of the world um, or what aspects of world history have already been defined by quantum mechanics? And there's a really easy answer there, right? Um, 1945, there was a really big bomb. A couple of days later, there was another one. Those were massive events that were only made possible because of quantum mechanics. Um, and then you have the information re um, uh, revolution. So, uh, transistors, LEDs, uh, they're all devices which require on quantum mechanical properties. Hmm. That nails it, but I would just, you know, the first thing is going to be flashing lights when people come into the classroom saying, um, quantum mechanics is weird. It's counterintuitive. It's going to inject a causality indeterminacy into your world, okay? Uh, concepts like you know, entanglement, superposition, uncertainty, um, work against, you know, a lot of the disciplining of thought that has taken place prior to entry into this classroom. So there's an element of unlearning um, going on. Um, and then, as Jason said, it's by also going back to the future saying, listen, all of these early ideas emerged out of a cross-fertilization with philosophy with um you know cosmologies of the day when the natural sciences broke off from you know what used to be called you know at one time all the sciences were under natural philosophy we went into our silos so also we have to bring in you know fit, we've been very lucky largely through the subvention of the carnegie corporation to be able to bring in physicists to our you know annual Q symposia that we hold out at the quarantine station here in Sydney. And the physicists are, are the ones who, you know, get people up to speed, but also act as a reality check to make sure that we're not, you know, stretching these concepts too far. Mm. Um, there's always going to be disagreement about, you know, where quantum effects wash out, you know, in something warm, wet, um, and large. Um, but that is increasingly changing with new discoveries of, you know, quantum phenomenon and everything from avian navigation to smell to um, now just over the last couple of weeks or actually last couple of months you know the whole idea of a quantum you know uh, phenomena in the brain is being demonstrated in experimental um, um, labs in britain and elsewhere but even yeah. if it is washing out right that's just emergence so you're having classical phenomena emerge from what quantum phenomena 
Um, that doesn't discount the quantum phenomena entirely. It just means there's something really interesting there that we need to understand. Mm. Why does this world arise from something else? You know, the technology that runs our modern world, again, it's completely dependent on quantum innovations. Mm. Uh, so you can live, you can believe our world is completely classical, but the infrastructure of our modern world isn't. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's interesting because one of the, I, I'm a, a novice on this stuff, obviously, but for if I was going to start, I, I had always had the explanation that quantum and classical were kind of just different levels. Like it, quantum work down here, but if you wanted to understand anything that was going on that at kind of a, I don't know, a molecular or a larger level, then, then Newton was up just fine. You know, yep. Um, yep. what do you think uh, about that idea of levels as it relates to kind of things going on in the world? That would still be the dominant view in, in the physics department. But increasingly, as quantum has spread into other disciplines, they're identifying, you know, quantum effects at beyond the subatomic level in chemistry, in biology, um, certainly like we were talking about, in, you know, in, in the tracking birds, um, how possibly um, other mammals communicate. Then in philosophy, you know, looking at the whole panpsychist, you know, how entanglement might actually be taking place between trees and objects that aren't mammals or humans or subatomic. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's work being done in all these areas, but putting that all to the side for one minute is just, is I think really is, as, as, as Jason has said, if you're looking at emergent phenomena, you know, where, where does the wave function collapse happen and why? That you move from quantum behavior to classical behavior. That's the observation, the measurement effect. This is the you know dominant concept coming out of the Copenhagen School. And what if the measurement now is the tool itself of measurement is a quantum computer? What does that do to the whole notion that no, it doesn't scale up? Because mm. a quantum computer is operating at a macro level from micro subatomic entangled superposition qubits. Okay. So that, you know, a lot of this is going to be um, grounds for new philosophical discussions. It's already happening. You know, Oxford had, has like four or five, you know, quantum philosophers, you know, doing this. In fact, you could say the quantum computer first emerged the idea of it from a discussion, you know, among philosophers, you know, it's not a dialogue of the deaf anymore. Hmm. Um, maybe within international relations, it was for quite some time, but certainly in other fields, um, this has been going on for some time. Yeah, just to tack onto that, though, um, I agree pretty much everything James has said. Um, but, you know, for to go to your original question, depending on what you want to do, Newtonian physics is completely fine. If you want to launch a rocket from here to there, it works. If you want to launch a rocket from here to a different solar system, at some point you need to take into account relativity, right? Otherwise you'll end up some inaccuracies, you'll end up where you don't want to end up. But that doesn't really matter for us. Um, you know, we're political scientists. We're not really interested in understanding things well enough. We just want to understand the world, uh, the world as to the best we possibly can. There's ontological questions. And we, we the discipline spent what, the last 30, 40 years dealing with ontological and epistemological questions. Um, I just think there's a, there's a, beyond the quantum stuff, there's a deeper like cosmological re revolution, which is coming to the fourth through quantum IR. And this is something that people like Katzenstein have picked up on, um, others like Jaris Grove, um, where that's going to lead us, you know, who knows? Uh, well, it sounds really to me um, that ultimately this is empowering as a pedagogical exercise, uh, the students get to go in and in some ways experience this and it's open to them contributing in an agentic way to the conversation because it's emergent. It's still coming through. It's still um, building. And so there's a way in which 
you need the physicists to come into the room and tell you when you've gone too far with your interpretations. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are uh, it's an exciting realm for to bring students together and once they get the vocabulary, once they get the principles down to kind of do that application process in ways that may actually end up producing a quantum computer someday. Yeah, if, you know, for me, the what the criteria would be of, you know, successful pedagogy in this case is it's a very low bar. It's a breaking down the disciplinary boundaries that keep scientists from conversing with social scientists, mm. natural scientists, physical scientists, break down the, the, the boundaries between philosophy and, and, and quantum mechanics, and breaking down, most importantly, this distinction that somehow um, international relations is a field that um, has no power. I'm always interested in this in terms of power knowledge. You know, we always used to think about the only way you could be effective, meaning having an impact on the world in national relations, is go off, take what you learn in the classroom, go off into some other agency, okay? Mm -hmm. um, instead, this puts the agency back on the individual, not whether you go into government or into an NGO or whatever, a corporation. But it means that everybody has the power to make the future. Uh, that's one of the most critical aspects and where it, it, I think, aligns with a lot of constructivist thinking is, you know, we make the world, um, but um, it does have philosophical implications in terms of offering, you know, an, a renewed sense of free will and agency to the individual and responsibility that comes with that. You know, if every choice you make is creating a new world, you're responsible for that world. Mm, um, mm. It's also a very Nietzschean idea of eternal recurrence. You know, if every decision you make, Nietzsche said, big or small, is going to come back, you know, and and haunt you, um, like Groundhog Day, um, and then you know that um, you better get it right. It it does. It it has a sort of serious ethical implication mm. as well. Um, and we would bring that into the classroom. Call it reflexivity. Um, some people have done work on this, you know, from constructivism, um, I think would, would, you know, find areas for a conversation about between quantum mechanics and sort of the reflexive movement in ethics and international relations. One of my former students at Brown has done a lot of really good work on that. Um, and I think that, um, it's, it's probably going to be where we have traction with, call it what you will, um, if there's ever going to be uh, a global movement to regulate the worst effects of quantum technology, because there are going to be some bad effects. Every new technology, particularly powerful ones, gets weaponized. Um, it's going to have to have this reflexive ethical aspect of it at the ground level. It mm -hmm. can't be after the fact, like we're doing with generative AI right now. Right. Well, uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to give you a chance to make a pitch for the event that's coming up at ISA and give people a chance to know how to find it. What's going on? Tell me a little bit about that. I'm getting this award for um, science and technology, and we're going to have a great roundtable there with some of my favorite critical IR folks. And Peter Katzenstein will be on it. Um, Thomas Bierstecker, Lena Hansen, Rebecca adler um, just people who've been, you know, working with us on this um, and have provided, in some ways, the, um, like Tom Bierstecker and Peter Katzstein have been very important for backing scholars, for doing mm. something that is uh, against the grain. Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And then we're screening our documentary, Project Q, War, Peace, and Quantum Mechanics, a, a shortened version, and we'll have a round table discussing that. Really excited about that. Thank you to, so much. I, I'm thrilled to be able to have you on here and to help explain this really interesting way, not just of thinking about IR, but of teaching it to students and empowering agency in the classroom. Okay. Thank you for the time and sharing your wisdom. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Jim. Okay. 
Teaching Curve podcast is made available in video and audio only versions at the Professional Resource Center of the International Studies Association. Video versions are available on ISA's YouTube channel. Audio versions can be found on all major podcast platforms. You can send feedback or suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isonet.org. Follow us on Twitter or X or whatever it is at Teaching Curve. Thank you again for joining us on the Teaching Curve. And remember, learn something every time you teach.